I want to tell her, but I don't know how. I'm not even sure she'd believe me if I did. You know what I was just thinking about? How are we going to get back to New Pegasus anyway? I asked Windthrasher as we walked into the courtyard. She looked at me confused, then pointed out towards the gate that led to the courtyard. Don't you remember? Sheena had Cutter and his team get the sky carriage for us, and they fixed it up. I looked to where she was pointing and saw the sky carriage sitting there, looking better than it did before we'd even left Cartwheel. Damn. Looks a lot nicer. Sheena was standing next to the sky carriage with her husband and son. When she saw us, she waved and came over walking. I heard that you would be leaving today, so I made sure to have your sky carriage brought over from the shop into town that was working on it. It looks wonderful, Empress Sheena, I said, walking close to it. Whoever had fixed the carriage had knocked out all the dents, fixed the shattered windows, and even painted it. It was now as black as my coat, and where the Steel Rangers symbol had been, was now the words Equestrian Express, just like my duster. Why did you put Equestrian Express on it? The Emperor chuckled. That was my idea, Shadow Star. You do work for old box tape, do you not? I used to trade with him back when I was still a young buck. I figured having his company's name on the side was better than traveling around with the symbol of those nasty steel rangers. I guess, but if I fly around in this, ponies will know it's me. That could put us at risk of getting us attacked again, I said. Stardust patted my head, saying, Don't worry too much about it. You should be proud of who you are. Yeah, Shadow. Don't worry about who knows it's you. Most ponies back home are too scared of you to do anything, Wingnut said. Maybe. But I guess you're right. I really do like it, I said with a smile. Aura rolled her eyes. Yeah, I'm just glad it's fixed. I'd hate to carry you all the way back to New Pegasus on my back. I winked at her. Ah, and here I thought you would have jumped at the chance for me riding you for hours on end. Aura blushed. Damn. Walked right into that one, didn't I? We all laughed. Then Sheena looked between Aura and I with a smile. I'm glad you two were able to finally show each other how you feel. Now I was blushing. It was all thanks to you, Sheena. Sheena bowed her head at me slightly. It was no problem. My mom likes to play matchmaker. Prince Fruitstripe said with a smile. It's a good thing she is good at it, or the townsfolk would get annoyed with her for being so nosy. Sheena's mouth fell open, and she looked back at her son. Son, I am not nosy. I just like to make sure my subjects are happy. Everyone laughed harder. As we did, I realized this was the first time I'd seen Sheena without a dress or some other outfit on. This was the first time I'd seen her glyph mark. I couldn't make out what it was, but it reminded me of something I'd seen on a member of the Sins. It was definitely some kind of tribal animal. Emperor Sheena... Can I ask what your glyph mark is? She looked back, down at me, and then at her own flanks. Oh, it is in the shape of an elephant's head. An elephant is a creature that you find in the zebra homelands. They are very smart animals. They are also very nurturing in the nature. And, from the stories I've heard, they never forget. Just like my wife, the emperor said with another chuckle. She still brings up things I did wrong from twenty years ago. Sheena just shook her head, refusing to take the bait. Anyway, when will you all be heading home? We were planning to leave right away. Once Doorstop shows up, that is. I'm right here, runt! Doorstop said, landing a second later next to the Emperor. Shortcake and two other cadets landing next to him. Oh, hey Shortcake. How are you liking the kingdom? I asked. She shrugged. It's loud here. And there's a lot of zebras and strange ponies I've only heard about, but never met. Apart from that, it's better than the stable. Stardust chuckled. Yeah, I remember those days. Shortcake smiled. I wish you could stay with us, Dusty. There's so much you could teach us about the wasteland. I know, but my place is with Shadow's friends. I should know. I'm one of them. Maybe one day you can come to Cartwheel and see us. Maybe one day, Stardust. But first, they need to learn how things work out here. Doorstop said. Hey, Doorstop. Where's all your stuff? Wingnut asked the older buck. Back in my room, 
I ain't going with y'all, he said. The cadets need me right here now, at least until they get used to working with Cutter and the Dashites here in the kingdom, that is. Wait, you're not coming back with us? What about Violet? I thought she needed you back at Frosty Summit, I asked. She does. But right now, things have settled down in New Pegasus, and Frosty Summit is far from most ponies that would attack it, like the Steel Rangers. And the Enclave won't bother them for a while. I did send Dr. Limbus there with a letter from Violet about what happened here. Will she be okay by herself? I asked. Ah, she's a lot tougher than she looks, Runt. Don't worry too much about her. The only thing she may have problems with is Dr. Cottage. But if I know Dr. Limbus, she will put him in her place. Damn, that's too bad. I was just starting to like you. Or I said with a snicker. I don't think I heard one griffin crack from you this entire trip. Ha! <laughs> you ain't bad, Aura. At least for a griffin. Y'all have a good head on your shoulders. And you know how to make a good wisecrack. I like that about you. And you aren't a sissy like Stardust! Doorstop said with a big smile. Stardust jaw dropped open. Hey, fuck you, old buck. Ha! Still got it. Doorstop said before looking back at me and ignoring Stardust. Shadow, do you think you'd be able to get a letter to some pony for me? I guess. I mean, it is my job. But who do you need a letter to? Isn't Dr. Limbus bringing one to Violet already? Doorstop got closer and whispered. I need you to take a letter to my sister. Even with Stable 97 being taken care of, I am still a Dashite, and can't go to Stratus to talk to her. How do you expect me to get a letter to Stratus? Still keeping his voice down, he said. It's not that hard. You go to New Pegasus. There's a small building there in the Strip that serves as a kind of skyport for the Enclave. Get a letter to them, and they'll make sure it gets to my sister. He pulled out a letter and gave it to me. Taking it, I said, No problem. I guess I can do that. He sighed and stood at his full height again. Thanks, Runt. Though I can't really pay you for doing this. I'm fresh out of caps. Aura looked over at us. If you want her to do something for your doorstop, you have to pay her. That's how a contract works. She's not a griffin, blood bird brain. Doorstop broomed. Aura just rolled her eyes. And there it is. She smirked. This whole time, I thought she was just a wingless griffin that was mutated by killing Joke to look like a pony. What I mean is, that's how business works. She gets paid for being a courier. Some of what's being paid to her also goes to Equestrian Express. It's okay. I'm sure Boxtape will understand. Doorstop has done a lot for us. The least I can do is a small thing for him. I said, trying to keep Aura and Doorstop from fighting. Oro's got a point, though. I should find some way to pay you, Runt. I shrugged. And how about you start calling me by name? If you do that, I'll call us even. Hmm. It might be easier to just find a way to pay you back in caps. But I guess I can put up with calling you Shadow. He said with a chuckle. Good. Well, if that's every pony, we should be going. As I said that, I realized a small problem. With Doorstop staying behind and Laser Light already heading back to New Pegasus, who was going to fly the Sky Carriage? Sardis' wings had been mended by one of the Unicorn Doctors, but he was told not to use them for a couple of days. Windthrush's body was still healing after her problem with the bloodlust, and getting, to, getting Aura to fly it wouldn't be an easy thing to do. Huh. How are we going to get back? I could pull the star... Sky carriage, Shadow. But we'd have to stop more often than when Doorstop flew it. Windthrasher said. I know, but I'd like you to rest as much as you can. Same for Stardust. My eyes fell on Aura. She looked over at me. Nope. I said it before, I'll say it again. I am not a taxi. I let my eyes get big and teary-eyed, my bottom lip poking out a little. Please, Aura. She looked away. And I said no, and that pouty face won't work. Wingnut looked at her with an evil grin. I could order you to do it. She grinned. No, you can't. My contract states that I'm a bodyguard. 
I can't be told to pull you anywhere in that sky carriage unless it was to save your life. I let my pouty face get even more sad looking as I let my ears droop back. But if you don't, Windthrash will have to pull the carriage and she's still sick. Even if she can, it will take us a long time to get home. A minute passed, still Aura doing her best to ignore me. I didn't let up. I know how to look pathetic when I want. Finally, she stopped. Fine. But you owe me big for the shadow. I smiled. Works for me. I'll gladly pay any price to get us home quicker. She grinned back and got very close to my ear, whispering, I hope you don't mind being tied up, because you just gave me permission to do whatever I want the entire night of my choosing. She giggled, and continued, Be careful. Sometimes it sucks when a plan backfires. Windthrasher snickered a few feet away. She's got you there, Shadow. Stardust and Wingnut looked confused. How did she get Stardust? A shadow? Windthresher grinned and walked past both stallions. It's girl's talk. Sorry. That made me smile as I turned to say goodbye to Sheena, the Emperor, and the rest. Thank you all for the help. I don't know what we do without it. any of you. The Emperor smiled. That's what we do here. Remember, you're always welcome back any time. Sheena moved closer and hugged me. My husband is right. Do come see us again when you can, and good luck on finding your mother. Then she turned towards her husband. I thought you had something to give, Chechado. The Emperor's huge mustache wobbled as he said, That's right! He pulled out a small whistle. My son and Cutter both told me you wanted to have one of our zap wing whistles to save you and keep you safe from that envy pony. So I made this for you the other day. Been meaning to give it to you since. Shina giggled and face hoofed. That is the stallion that I fell in love with. So forgetful, but so thoughtful. Thank you, my love, the Emperor said, moving down to kiss his wife for a moment. I took the whistle from him, putting it into one of the pockets on my duster. Thank you, Emperor. This will help us a lot if we run into Envy again while we're heading back home. <laughs> Think nothing of it, he said with a bark of a laugh. I hugged him, then Sheena, one more time. I'll miss this place. It almost feels like home when I'm here. That is normal for most ponies when they come to the kingdom. But I am glad that you enjoyed your stay. Safe travel, Shadow, Sheena said, as she looked past me at Yaksha, who was getting into the sky carriage. Yaksha, why are you going with them? Yaksha looked back at Sheena. I told you last night that I was heading out. Did I not make that clear? No, but I thought that you meant you were heading back to the ruins, Sheena said, sounding hurt. No, my work here is complete. I needed to head back to New Pegasus to look into something else. Though, I will return once I am finished there, Yaksha said with a smile. That is too bad. I am going to miss our conversations. Yaksha walked back out of the sky carriage and hugged Sheena. I will as well, well Empress. Oh, and I almost forget. If my friends come looking for me, can you tell him where that I went? He'll know where to find me in New Pegasus. You mean that ghoulish-looking stallion? I guess that I can do that. Sheena said, sounding confused. Thank you. Also, make sure that you keep that husband of yours in check. If it was not for you, this place would not be as wonderful as it is. Yaksha said with an even bigger smile. I will do that. Sheena said, smiling back. Yeah, enough of the long goodbyes. Can we get going already? Aura said as she was already strapping into the harnesses in the scary carriage. We all headed back to the carriage and loaded up. Aura took to the air and she flew higher as we all waved goodbye to the kingdom and our friends who were staying behind. Then Aura turned and started heading southwest. As she did, I got one good look to the north, where the Twin Cities were just visible in the distance and just past that, the same color of light that I saw from before when I was in Mill City Tower. Then I saw it before my memories. They were still blocked and I had no idea what it was. Now my eyes fell on the light reaching up to the clouds as it finally hit me. It was my home. My old home. The place where I was born. The place where my family used to be. As we flew away and the night light faded from the distance, 
I wanted nothing more than to turn around and go back to my first home, the Crystal Empire. Instead, I put a hoof to the glass of the rear window and whispered, Goodbye. A couple of hours passed, and we were still flying fast towards New Pegasus. The temperature started to get warmer the further we got away from the Midwest. At first, I missed the nice cold air, but I had to admit, I missed the warmer weather down south. Though, there still wasn't even close to how warm it would get when we'd get back home. Stardust and Wind Thrasher were both talking to each other about different things that I didn't care to listen to. Wingnut was talking with Yaksha, about asking her about some zebra concoctions and how they worked. From the sound of it, Yaksha was very good at making many different kinds of potions that could help, uh, or hurt, a pony. Wingnut, being the type of pony who soaked up information like a sponge and did with water, never stopped with his string of questions. Yaksha didn't seem to mind, either. In fact, she sounded like she wanted to tell him as much as she could about her culture. I, of course, was bored to tears. Aura was enough for talking while she was flying this fast. I couldn't get a word in between Stardust and Wind Thrasher, and I didn't even understand half of what Yaksha and Wingnut were talking about. So I pulled out the box of memory orbs Mom gave me from my saddlebags and opened it. The last one in the row was the one Mom said was very long. So far, I'd been putting off watching it because I either didn't seem to find enough time or was always doing something. Even now, it may not be safe to jump into the orb. And we could attack us again at any moment, or something worse could happen. But if I don't do it now, then, well, when would I? Hey, Aura, do you think it's safe if I jump into Mom's last memory orb? She looked back over her shoulder, and the window in front of us had holes in it so the flyer could talk to the ponies in the carriage. You should be fine. Even if something happens, you can trust us to keep you safe. Okay. I don't know how long this will take, so if we get home before I, uh, back out, please don't do anything to embarrass me. She grinned. No promises. Rolling my eyes, I sat back on the front seat and concentrated my magic on the last of Mom's memory orbs. The one she said had belonged to one of the children of the night. With my luck, it would be another Night Stalker one. That pony had too many memory orbs for a captain who ran a secret group of assassins. It took a minute for me to make a connection. Then there was a spark, and the world melted away. Well, definitely not a Night Stalker orb. The question is, what kind of creature was I in? Let's see. Wings, that's not hard to miss, but they're bigger than the ones I've felt on most Pegasus. I could feel something strange on my front hooves. No, these aren't hooves, these are talons. I could tell already that my host had a beak, as well as a long tail with paws. Holy shit, I'm a griffin. Not just any griffin, this has to be Greta. She was standing in a large room, looking past a set of Pegasi power armor. Next to her was none other than Night Stalker himself, who was talking with Minette and Amethyst Star. What I don't understand, Min, is how this armor is any different than my last set, Night Stalker said as he looked over the black suit. I agree. Apart from some more gems and the style of the helmet, this tail stinger, it all looks the same, my host said. Minette looked horrified. What do you mean it looks the same? It's a masterpiece, sir. I've spent the past two months developing this new suit for you, Captain. I've redone the blades for your wings so they won't interfere with your flight. Also, you won't have to worry about cutting yourself if you're doing some kind of complicated maneuver or attack. The stinger on the tail can be used to either poison, like before, or you can pump a high dose of magical energy through it, turning your target into dust in seconds. I've also added more gems to the armor as well. Before, the only spell you had was the one that blocked small caliber ammunition. Now I've made it a gem so it can how powerful that it can divert high caliber as well. I've also added a gem so that it will take away the stealth buck and work similar like it. I also had notes that we obtained from the MAS so that the gem will recharge itself. The effect of your visibility will last for only two minutes, but it's still useful. I've also added my own spell. The one Stable Tech uses for Stable Tech targeting spells on a pip buck. Nightstalker smiled. I guess that can be useful, but the armor already has sats and EFS. So what use is having an extra gem spell in the armor going to help? Amethyst Star spoke up this time. You don't understand, Captain. Min modified her original spell. Unlike with Sats, you'll be able to move while the spell is active. It will charge your perception of time to around 30 seconds, giving you time to either escape or 
just make use of anything else for a quick and deadly attack. To the pony you're fighting, it'll seem as if you vanish from sight. My host's eyes widened a little as she smiled. Well, that could be a useful trick. No, with all the extra gear, wouldn't this armor be heavier? Not easy to fly in heavy armor. Monette giggled joyfully. You would think so, silly, but no. The armor's in your design. It's lighter weight and three times stronger. The captain will be able to move faster than he did in his old set of armor. I take it back. I think that I like this new set of armor, Night Stalker said, slowly taking a walk around the armor. You finished a jet in time for the assault on the Crimson Canyon, too. Good work, Min. Uh, I'm sorry, Captain. It's not quite finished yet. I'm still finishing up with the last of the spell matrices for the targeting system and how the helmet will react with the armor itself, Manette said, looking sheepish. Night Stalker didn't look as happy as he did a moment ago. That's too bad. How long will it take to finish up? Hmm. Well, if you don't need me for the assault, then I can finish it within the next hour or so. You could also wait to start the assault, though. I won't be able to test everything in the suit until tomorrow. Night Stalker laughed. It's fine, Min. We'll have help from the Shadow Bolts and the Royal Guard for this attack. You can take all the time you need. Minette beamed. You're the best, Captain. My host and Night Stalker left the room as the two unicorns started working again on the power armor. I could now see that they were in the lucky horseshoe like before. As they walked to one of the large windows that overlooked the city, Greta asked, I'm surprised you were able to get help from both the Shadow Bolts and the Royal Guard for this. How are we going to keep our secret group secret with so many ponies around during a fight like this? I've already thought about that, Night Stalker said as he watched the ponies far below. To most Equestria, I'm just a guard captain overseeing things in the city. The rest of you have your own covers, and that's why I'm only letting a few of the children join in the fight. My host chuckled. It won't be much of a surprise if I'm with you, since I'm always with you. But how will you explain the others? Thunderlane is thought to be a guard like myself. At first, I wasn't sure what to do with Lightning Dust, but then I figured, since she's a former Wonderbolt, I could say that she's joined up with the guard as well. I'm also having trouble figuring out what to do with Cloudy Nights. She's an active scout for the army now, at least on paper. She used to be a Shadow Bolt. Who could just say that Rainbow asked for her help in this assault? Night Stalker took a moment about that. Yeah, that could work. You still didn't tell me how you got both the Guard and the Shadow Bolts to help? He grinned. I'm a persuasive stallion. <laughs> and I'm a parasite. Night Stalker looked thoughtful as he said. Hmm. You can eat a whole lot when you want to, but I don't think you can handle as much as a Parasprite can. My host grinned. Fuck you, Mooney. He winked at her. Now, is there anything? Any way to talk to your captain? Yeah, I'll let you know when he shows up. You're in too good of a mood to be the captain I know. What's got you so chipper? What? I can't be happy now and then, he asked, looking offended. I guess, but it's not normal for you, at least not of late. Maybe lightning dust is having a good impact on you. I noticed as she said this, the smile she gave felt forced. Night Stalker didn't seem to notice. Maybe, but I've been feeling a lot happier ever since she agreed to marry me. She's a good mare. Night Stalker must have picked up on the tone of her voice because he looked over at Greta. But you don't approve. My host sighed. It's not that I don't like her. She's great and I'm glad she makes you happy. I just thought that you had feelings for another pony is all. I do, or did. It's just that I realized how I feel about her doesn't matter. What I want, I can't have. For a long time, I didn't think I'd ever find a pony who understood me the way she does. Then I had Lightning join us. She knew me before I was the captain, and it's nice to have that. She understands me almost as much as you do, my old friend. My host forced another smile. Yeah, 
and I get where you're coming from. I just want to make sure you don't do something you'll regret later on, is all. And I assure you, I'm not. Although I did want to ask you something regarding the wedding. My host looked over at Nightstalker quizzically. What's that? Most stallions have a, well, best stallion when they get married. Normally, it's someone that they've been friends with for a long time. I don't have any pony like that. Not since Big Mac. You know... Died. Yeah. Well, I know you're not a stallion, but... Would you be my best griff instead? With you by my side, I know the day will be perfect. There's no pony or griffin else I'd rather have with me. Me? Why would you want me up there? Because you're my best friend. Hell, you're almost like a sister to me. You've always been there for me ever since I was a scared little colt. My host smiled as she thought back on an old memory. I can still remember that day I found you half frozen in the mountains. Nightstalker laughed. I think that I almost gave your granny a heart attack when I woke up two days later screaming my head off. Her, you almost give me a heart attack, asshole. The two of them laughed before Nightstalker said, So, will you do it? Greta smiled again. I'd be honored. Right then, Thunderlane walked in from another hallway. Captain, it's almost time to head out. Right. Thank you, Thunderlane. Are the others ready? The Black Pegasus rolled his eyes. Lightning Dust is still getting dressed, and the others are ready to go. Bab is still trying to convince me to talk you into letting her go as well. Night Stalker sighed. I've already told her that I need her here to keep an eye on the wear. I've told her three times. I just think that she wants to test out the new model of power armor she got from her cousin. My host chuckled. That sounds about right. She's been practicing with every chance she gets in the training room. Thunder Lane looked over at Greta with a bored expression. Oh yeah, there's a call for you, Griffin. I have a name, jackass. Greta said as she walked past the Black Pegasus. I'll go see who's calling, then join you in the roof, Captain. Night Stalker watched her go, saying, It's probably Granny calling again. Tell her I said hi. My host waved a talon. I'll be sure to do that. As my host walked away, I heard Night Stalker talk to Thunderlane. Thunderlane, I know how you feel about griffins and their place in this war, but could you stop treating Greta like that? She's a member of the team as much as you are. Thunderlane's response was hard to make out as Greta walked to a small library. There was a few comfy-looking chairs and a phone. Also, the former prince, who now went by nowhere, was sitting in one of the chairs, reading an old book that looked like it had stars on the cover. He looked up from his book as he looked got, but at least his mane was cut short again. He looked better than he did, and when it was long. Good day, Greta. What brings you to the library? Just a phone call. How's the research going? My host asked as he sat down next to the table with a phone on it. It is slow work. And I feel like I am doing something wrong by reading these old books written by the Star Cattery. I know, understand, why the rest of my people shun them, he said, getting back to his work. I know how you feel. Do you really? He asked, looking over at the griffin with one eye. Well, maybe not the same way. He chuckled and went back to reading. As he did, Greta picked up the phone. Hello, this is Greta. A cute voice sounded out the receiver. Hey, Greta. It's so good to hear your voice again. <laughs> Prickly pedal. This is a surprise. Why are you calling me and not your brother? Oh, I'm sure he's busy. Doing something top secret or dangerous as usual. Pedal said with a mock sigh. My host laughed. Not right now. I'll let you count giving Thunderlane a hard time is dangerous. So, what's up? You know how Mooney's planning on spending the day with me later this week? Yeah, he said it's your first time in the city itself. Yep, I mean, I've been living near Las Pegasus for a while now, but I've been too busy with Stable 28's construction and the other project on sightseeing. 
Uh, both projects are keeping me running from time to time all over the place. And I have to keep checking up on Halo 1 and 2 as well. Doesn't Stable Tech have any other supervisors that can take care of some of the workload? Greta asked. They do, but Apple Bloom only trusts me with both Halo sites and the secret project she's working on with you guys. If that's true, then why are you working on Stable 28 as well? Because I wanted to. It's one of the biggest stables I've done so far. And, with the idea of Scootaloo's having for it, I just couldn't pass it up. Understandable. Anyway, what were you going to say about your time here in the city? Oh yeah, well, I was able to finish up with a few things faster than I thought, so I decided to start my vacation early. I'm at the Applewood right now. I was wondering if you could help me surprise Mooney. My host winced. You know how much he hates surprises. Petal giggled. Duh! That's what makes it so fun! My host smiled. True. But sadly, today isn't the best day for us to drag him away from work. We have... something to do today. Ah, damn. Well, how long is that something going to take? In a few hours at best. Maybe longer if something goes wrong. Well, how about this? If you two are freed up by tonight, then we can surprise him. If not, we'll make it tomorrow morning. Hmm. I may be able to make that work. You're so awesome, Greta. Yeah, I know. But I can't talk much longer. I have to get ready. Do you need my help with anything else? No. I'll be fine. I have to make a call to Sweetie Belle anyway. She's doing a show here next week, and I want to see if she'll let me watch from backstage. Good luck with that, Petal. I'll talk to you later. Petal giggled on the other end. <laughs> Hope to see you tonight. Oh, I'm in room two, uh, 2077, if you need to call me back. Be safe out there, Greta. Yeah, I will. My host said, then she hung up. You do know that springing a surprise on Night Stalker is not a good idea. Noir said. With most ponies, yeah. But if any pony can get away with it, it's Petal. Also, you didn't hear a thing about this, got it? Noir smiled. I have no idea what you are talking about, Greta. Greta got to her talons, stretching as she walked out of the room. She turned down the hall and made her way over to an elevator. She was joined by lightning dust before the door closed. Hey, I'm not the only one running late. That's good to know. My host smiled as she pushed a button to the top floor. I think you're just in time, lightning. I guess it was the first time for everything, she said with a cute giggle. The two of them rode the elevator the rest of the way up in silence. A moment later, they walked into a huge bright room that I'd been in once before. It was where Mr. Topps lived, or at least the huge monitor his face showed up on. The two of them made their way over to where Night Stalker was waiting with Thunder Lane and Cloudy Nights. I remembered then that Cloudy Nights used to be Pink Rose, the young mare who ran away from home to be with her buck friend. She was older than I thought. But she wasn't old, but older than Night Stalker. How many years ago did she leave home? She was cute, though, with her light pink coat and shocking green mane and tail. Her mane even had a long streak of red in it. Her eyes matched her mane, and they seemed to sparkle with energy and life. I could see what the stallion she left home for fell for her. It's funny how her journal was the first thing I'd found when I left Stable 28. I wish I could find out how she ended up going from that shack to working with the children. Night Stalker looked over at Greta and Lightning Dust as they approached. Perfect. Now that we're all here, let's go over the plan before we head out. Thunder Lane rolled his eyes. Captain, what's to go over? We strike fast and hard. Our intel says there's only about 200 zebras in the canyon. Hell, with the whole team, we could take them down without much effort. Thunder Lane? Don't underestimate our enemies. From what we know, there's a high-ranking zebra with them. Nuer believes it's one of his brothers. If so, that means the zebras with him are elite. That's why we called in the guard and the shadow bolts. Night Stalker said. You put too much trust in that stripe. For all we know, this could be a trap. Thunderlane said. I put as much trust of into him as I do the rest of you. Nuer made me a blood oath, saying that he has done everything in his power to help us find the threat and his knowledge of old Zubert lore has been a great help with falling shadows. 
Thunderlane turned red as he yelled. He's the enemy's son! What's wrong with you, Night Stalker? Have you lost your fucking mind? Night Stalker didn't yell back. He slowly walked closer to Thunderlane until his nose was a hair's breadth away from the other Pegasus. You should remember your place, Thunderlane. And you should also remember that I was the one who requested you to join the children. If it wasn't for me and the lies I told, you'd be in court-martialed for what you did when you were my commanding officer. You owe me everything, Thunderlane. That goes for your trust in my actions. Or have I not proven myself to you yet? For a long moment, the two just stared at each other. And then finally, Thunderlane broke and looked away. Sorry, sir, won't happen again. See that it doesn't. Night Stalker said before turning back to address the rest of his team. This is what we're going to do. Our objective is to fly in and take out the sentries guarding the canyon. We expect them to be wearing stealth cloaks, so make sure you have on your thermal goggles. The kills need to be made quickly and silently. If they give away our positions too quickly, the rest of the guard will be in danger. The shadow bolts are acting as our backup and our eyes in the sky while we're attacking the sentries. They will only join the fight once the rest of us and the card is in the canyon. Cloudy Knight spoke up. What are our entry points? For us, we can fly right in. But on the ground, there's only two ways in. The guard will be moving in from both points on the east and west of the Kirimson Canyon. This way, none of the zebras can escape once the attack has started. My host stepped forward. This mission needs to be done quick and clean. It's bad enough that we let all the zebras slip past us as long as they have. Right now, they're too close to New Pegasus. We can't let it get out that a huge number of them made it so far into Equestria. We won't let you down. Cloudy Knight said with a big smile. We'll show them why you don't mess with the children of the night, or Princess Luna. Night Stalker smiled. This is how we'll go in. Thunder Lane, you'll be with Lightning. You two take down the sentries from the west. Make sure that none are left alive. Cloudy Knights, I need you to take the north, and if you finish your sentries there, then join Lightning and Thunderlane. Greta and I will take the east and south. Radio in once you've taken down your targets. Everyone saluted Night Stalker, saying in unison, Yes, sir! Good. Now let's move out. Night Stalker said, walking over to the door that led to the small balcony that faced away from the strip, waiting for him and his other set of power armor. He stepped into it, letting it close around his body. Every pony followed as he jumped into the air, leading his team southwest. As they flew, Greta pulled on a helmet with goggles, then pushed a button on the side as she said, Team one is a go, and get to your posts. Cloudy night, you do the same. Don't worry about waiting for us. Strike as soon as you can. The three other Pegasi nodded. They flew past Night Stalker and Greta as the land zoomed away under them. When they were further ahead, my host moved closer to her friend, then said over the wind, You ready for this? He looked over at her. About as ready as I'll ever be. What about you? Greta chuckled. I always get nervous when we do go into fights like this. <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't think I'll ever get used to it. As they flew, I could see the cliffs of Crimson Canyon getting closer. It was strange to think that Aura's home used to be in a place where the zebras held up. I guess it makes sense since it was easy to defend, at least for griffins. I wonder how zebras would do when an assault like this one's coming. As they drew closer to the canyon, Night Stalker started to fly higher. My host followed close to his side. As they went up, Night Stalker tapped a gem in his armor, then said, Commander Blaze, this is Night Stalker. Are your Pegasi in place? I could hear his voice through the radio in Greta's helmet, and then a reply from a mare. Captain, we are in place and waiting for your signal. We are just above the clouds. Greta responded this time. Have you seen any movement in the canyon? Only a couple of stripes guarding the borders. We think that they're using the caves to stay out of sight. Crimson Canyon is full of caves and tunnels. The mayor responded. Good. Let my team take out those sentries first, then we'll have the guard move in. Your Pegasi will follow them, Night Stalker said. Roger. I'll relay the orders to Commander Brushel. They both cut off their radios, and Night Stalker said. Something doesn't feel right. Yeah, so. They don't have any way of knowing we're coming. The Pegasi should have seen at least a few of them wandering the canyon. Not just the sentries on the edges. Maybe they're being careful. 
Hmm, maybe. But be ready for anything, Night Stalker says as he looked down. We should be in position. I'll drop first and get the two sentries on the left of the entrance. You take care of the three on that side. My host looked down. I could see five zebras standing on the top of the cliffs that overlooked the valley near a small town just outside the entrance of the canyon. Roger. Night Stalker flipped on his radio again. Team, are you in place? Team one is ready. We have three stripes sighted, Thunderlane replied. I'm good too, sir. Only two on my end, Cloudy Knight said. Good. Follow them fast and quietly. Let me know when you're done. Night Stalker out. Greta smiled. Ready when you are, Mooney. I hate it when you call me that, he said with a sigh. Let's get this over with. My host chuckled to herself as Night Stalker folded his wings and started to dive. Greta reached behind herself and pulled out two oddly shaped swords. Funny, one of them looked like the one I had just had. Then she too folded her wings, following Night Stalker as he silently dove for the zebras. Night Stalker started to slowly pull open his wings as they drew closer. I could see slightly blue glowing blades at the edges of his wings, much like the ones around Greta's swords. Before I could take a better look at them, my host flipped around, letting her rear paws slam into the first zebra. His body crunched under her. I could feel bones breaking as he cushioned her fall. He started to scream, but one of Greta's swords sliced neatly into his skull. The zebra's closest to them looked at Greta with his jaw open in shock. The expression only lasted a moment. Then it changed to confusion as Greta's other sword sliced open his neck. As his body started to fall, my host flapped her wings again. And she darted for the last sentry who was still turning towards the sound of the fallen zebras. He took a sword through the eye before he could finish his turn. The attack only lasted maybe five seconds. That was all, and she looked down, took down all three zebras in that small margin of time. I'm glad I would never have to fight a griffin like her. No, wait. Aura's family's descended from Greta. That meant Gina was too. Fuck. If she was even half as good as her great-something grandmother, I was in trouble if I were to deal with her again. Greta looked over to the gap in the cliff where Night Stalker was standing next to two headless zebras. He chuckled lightly. I thought you would have finished them off quicker. You're not losing your touch, are you, old friend? <laughs> and I had to deal with three. You only had two. It's getting old now, smartass. Night Stalker just chuckled again as the rest of his team reported in. Team 1's targets down are, are down, sir. I heard Thunder Lane say. Mine too, responded Cloudy Knights. Good. I'll have you wait for my signal. Greta and I will sneak down and see if we can spot any more centuries, Night Stalker said. The two of them jumped down and slowly glided to the canyon floor. It was odd to see the place so barren. It seemed like such a sad place without the centuries and the tents and griffins had around. There were still two large rocks in the middle of the canyon, but they were boring since neither of them had carvings into the sculptures or the Wall of Talon's laws yet. He is too quiet, Greta said as she slowly walked around. Yes, it is, Night Stalker said as he walked towards the center of the canyon. Looks like someone was here not long ago. The place feels abandoned. Now I'll go check the caves, Greta said as she started to fly into the air. Night Stalker had just made it over the rocks. Greta! My host stopped and looked back. What? She flew back to him and they whispered. Don't yell like that, Captain. You'll wake any zebras that might be near. Night Stalker looked scared as he pointed at the larger rock. It was a trick. What are you talking about? Greta said as she turned to see what Night Stalker was looking at. Then my host's eyes went wide as she saw it. A mare's body was staked at the larger rock. Her eyes had been cut out and her tongue as well. Her hooves had a stake stabbed through them, holding her into the sandstone behind her. Carved into her naked torso was the single word, ALMOST. A small dagger was sunk at the bottom of the exclamation point. Is that... Greta asked. Yeah. It's Magnolia. She's the mare who sings at the nightclub at the Lucky Horseshoe. Fuck. Night Stalker slammed his hooves on the button of his radio. It was a trap. The centuries were just bait. The zebras already left. They may be heading for... Before he could finish, Manette appeared in front of Night Stalker. She was breathing hard. Sir, 
The Zebras are attacking Las Pegasus. There's at least 400 of them. Damn it. How do they know? He yelled before going back to his radio. Every pony, head back to Las Pegasus. It's under attack. A few voices echoed through the radio as they all responded. Greta started to speak. We have to head back right now. Night Stalker said. I know. Manette, is the suit ready? I've just reattached the power unit, but yes, she said. Good. Teleport back right now and get it ready. I'll be there shortly. Tell the rest of the team to attack and defend the city as best they can. Babs is in charge until I get back. Yes, sir. Oh, and what should I do about Noir? He wanted to help, but I told him to stay back. We could use him right now, but I'm not sure if he's the one who got the message out to the rest of us about our plan. For now, we have to wait until I say otherwise. Yes, sir, she said, and in a flash, she was gone. Let's go, Night Stalker said as he jumped into the air, right as over a hundred Pegasi came out of the clouds and all headed for Lost Pegasus. Greta followed, saying, Boss, why didn't you have Minette teleport us back as well? We're going to need her magic for this fight. I don't want her tired out just so we can get back faster. You understood. Greta started to say, then her eyes went wide. Ah, shit. Just then, they caught up with the rest of the Pegasi when Night Stalker asked. What? Petals at the Applewood. What? No, she's not. She's not coming to the city for another three days. No, she's there now. She's the one that called earlier. She wanted to surprise you. Fuck. This day can't get any worse. Night Stalker yelled. He tapped a different gem on his helmet and spoke urgently. Amethyst Star, activate the Lucky Horseshoe's defenses. Get those damned robots into the streets to stop the zebras. Also, send Comet Tail to the Applewood and have her get my sister and bring her to the tower. She said she's in room 2077, Greta said. Night Stalker did, then he tapped the gem again and started to fly faster. As they all flew on, an orange glow started to show near Las Pegasus. The closer they got, the more the glow brightened. The city was on fire. Damn it! And they set the outer parts of the city on fire, Greta said. They'll pay. Every last one. Night Stalker yelled as he flew higher towards the Lucky Horseshoe. Every pony attack! Make sure you keep as many ponies in the city safe. And for Celestia's sake, don't let the stripes get a drop on you! As they reached the edge of the city, the ponies, the shadow bolts, scattered. Magical energy and plasma rifles started firing down on this trip at scores of wings dove for the advancing zebras. Greta flew up to the top of the Lucky Horseshoe with Night Stalker. Thunder Lane, Lightning Dust, and Cloudy Nights joined them a moment later, all of them looking down at the fight that was happening far below. What do we do now, Captain? Cloudy Nights asked as we, she watched in horror. I want all of you to do whatever it takes to defend the city. Kill as many of the stripes as you can, Night Stalker said. As he turned towards the small door that was set towards the middle of the Lucky Horseshoe, just under the tall spire. What about you, Captain? Thunderlane asked. I'll join you momentarily. Now, move out! Cloudy Knights and Thunderlane took off. Lightning ran over to Night Stalker and kissed him for a moment, then said, Stay safe. My host looked away the moment that they kissed. As Night Stalker said, You too. Now go. She flew off, her twin blade saddles firing as she dove for the ground. Once she was gone, Manette came through the door, floating two sets of power armor behind her. Amethyst Star, close behind, dressed in black combat armor. When Manette finally pushed past the rest of the team, she said, Sorry it took so long, boss, but it's ready now. Good job, Manette. Do you think you'll be able to help in the fight? Night Stalker asked. She beamed. No problem. Star and I'll be heading down that way now. My host looked at the second set of power armor. I could tell it was a bit bigger than Night Stalker's, but it was just as black and menacing. Min, what's that? Amethyst Star answered. It's Griffin power armor. Rainbow Dash said it was something new the Griffins are using during some of the bigger fights. She got this for you, and I just figured, doing my own touch-ups. Greta looked it over. He doesn't protect as much as Night Stalker's does. It also looks like it would slow me down. It won't. It's lightweight, at least for a griffin, and it's flexible enough to handle all kinds of flying and fighting you do. It'll protect you from better than your combat armor does. 
Amethyst Star said with a small blush. Just use it, Greta. I don't plan on losing any of you today. Night Stalker said before turning to another pony in power armor. Babs, I wanted to test out that new suit. Well, here's your chance. I want you to go help protect the Strip. Use your heavy guns to keep the advancing zebras from getting further into the city. Yes, sir! Babs said from inside her armor. Then she ran towards the edge of the tower and jumped off yelling, Look out below! Is she crazy? How well can power armor protect you from a fall like that? I heard a loud boom from Babs landing in the street far below, followed by the sounds of a minigun going off. I guess she's okay. Night Stalker ignored her and turned towards Noir. You stay here. But Captain, I can help. No, you'll only make things worse. Stay here and wait for my orders. Noir stomped a hoof. I swore to you that I will serve you. I can help. He fell to the ground as the collar around his neck shocked him. He screamed for only a moment before he laid there, breathing hard. You really need to learn to watch that temper of yours. He turned back to Amethyst Star. Change of plans. You keep an eye on him while Manette goes out and helps the rest of us. Yes, sir. She said as she walked over to help Noir up. My host in the meantime moved over to the Griffin Power Armor and opened it with a gem on the back and stepped into it. It closed smoothly on her. The armor fit like a glove covering the chest, neck, and head. The armor also moved to cover a good amount of her torso. Her wings were mostly covered, save for her feathers, around her tail and the tip of her talons. Her beak was left uncovered. Her eyes were shielded by a blood-red visor. She pulled out her swords and smiled. Okay, this isn't as bad as I thought. Night Stalker just stepped out of his older set and into the newer one. Trust me, it's a wonderful feeling. Now... Let's show those zebras why you don't mess with the children of the night. I'll see about helping Comet Tail. I'll make sure she can get to pedal to safety, then I'll regroup with you. Greta said as she opened her wings. Good idea. I'm going to see if I can find the general who's leading the zebras. Night Stalker said as he snapped open his wings. The blue glowing sword shimmering on the edges of his wings arms. Try not to kill him if you can. The M.O.M. wants him alive, Manette said. Night Stalker looked back at her. Fuck Pinkie Pie and what she wants. This is my city. He tapped one of the many gems on his armor, and in a flash of blue light, he vanished, just like the stranger. Manette beamed again. Hey, it worked! I wasn't sure it would since it's on his first test run. Min, yeah, are you sure that new armor will help keep the captain safe? My host asked before she jumped into the air. Manette shrugged. Depends on how he uses it. The captain likes to get in close for the kills, that's why I put as much protection magic as I could on the suit. The problem is, he's more of a stealth killer. If he goes rushing in for a better fight than him, he may not do so well. The armor can only protect him so much. You underestimate him. He's been training with Zappen. I mean, Noir, for two months now. He's grown as a hoof-to-hoof -hoof fighter. He still can't beat Noir in a one-hand hoof-to-hoof fight. Greta laughed and took off, yelling down at Manette. Yeah, maybe in a fair fight. The Night Stalker doesn't fight fair. Manette smiled again, then in a flash she was gone. In the corner of my host's eyes, I saw a blue unicorn reappear on the street, using her magic to help Babs fight off 15 zebras who were trying to push past the power-armored mare. Then my host turned in flight and headed straight for the Applewood. She didn't get far before the three zebras killing a group of ponies who'd gotten stuck on a dead-end alleyway. She dove for them, her blades cutting neatly through the air as she dropped into them. As she landed, her blades decapitated one, sending his head arcing toward the fleeing ponies. Her other blade half slid away through the second zebra's head before coming to a halt. Greta spun around, lifting the already dead zebra off the ground and hurling his body towards the last one, who was just turning to see what happened. The dead zebra's body flew off the end of Greta's sword and slammed into the last zebra. He cried out in pain for only a moment as his body crunched against the far wall. My host put an end to that by stabbing him in the heart. Then something tinged off her armor. She turned and saw five more zebras running towards her across the street. Ah, shit, Greta said as she backed down the alley. 
doing her best to avoid the shots the zebras were firing. Then it seemed as if her suit acted on its own. The power armor made a strange sound as something poked out from its back. As it did, a small marker showed up on her visor. She used it to aim, then fired what sounded like a rifle on her back. The closest one to her fell and went rolling on the ground, his head blown clean off his shoulders. A second shot rang out as Greta fired around and the pony next. Two, then flew back into a third. The fourth stopped, the hurling, something towards her. It was a shiny grenade with a blue band around it. It was a spark grenade. They knew that the ponies, griffins, whatever, here had power armor and they came prepared. Greta jumped back again. I could tell it wouldn't be fast enough. As the grenade went off, it was about to land, next to Greta, another Pegasus in combat armor came flying in, kicking the grenade flying harmlessly the way it came. It went off, not hurting the zebra, but also it was out of range of Greta. The man who just saved my host pulled the rifle off of her back and fired twice. Both the zebras fell with the chunks of their heads missing. Greta laughed and said, Good timing, Comet Tail. The mare turned and winked. Luckily, I was flying over you when I saw them attacking. Where's Petal? Greta asked. I was hoping you would know. She's not in her room. I was about to see if she came running out here when the zebras attacked, but I haven't seen her yet. Commentail said, looking past her at the few remaining ponies who looked terrified. Fuck. We have to find her, Greta said, looking back at the ponies. Any of you see a green pegasus with a pink mane by chance? No. No pony like that was with us when we were running, a stallion responded. Greta swore again. Fuck. Well, you should all head to the north exit of the Strip. So far, that's the clear way. As soon as you're clear of the city, try and find a safe place to hide till it's over. They all ran past the two. Then Comatail said, The others need our help. Let's try and clean up the zebras around here, for now. Then we can go looking for Petal. If we still can't find her, then we'll regroup with the captain. Good idea. I just hope she thought to run to Lucky Horseshoe. She knows it's safe there. She did help build it, Greta said before they both flew into the air. For the next couple of hours, I watched as Greta fought beside Comet Tail, and a couple of shuttle bolts as they did whatever they could to fight back the zebras who were trying to take the city. Even in the power armor, Greta moved unlike any griffin or pony I'd seen fight before. She darted right at an enemy, ignoring the raised rifle or battle saddles, and takes them down without even getting shot. Her twin swords danced through the air like they were an extension of her talons. Every time she twisted around, blood followed. As the battle went on, I caught sight of every one of the children fighting. I now understood why Knotstalker chose them. Thunderlane had to be one of the fastest ponies I've ever seen in a fight. They didn't fly as fast as Night Stalker or Stardust did, but his attacks were spot on and quick. He could take out an enemy and be on to another fight before the zebra's body even hit the ground. He loaded so fast I thought it was just a blur, and that was just with his rifle. His battle saddle barked with each pass he made as he flew over the zebras. None of them lived long enough to warn their comrades about the Black Pegasus. Manette wasn't just great at making new kinds of spells that could help her team. Like with the gem she put in Nightstalker's armor. No, she knew how to use her magic to kill as well. She darted around the zebras as they tried to close in to finish her off, only to have the blue unicorn lightly dart around them and fire a small focused beam of magic at them. The beam of light was no bigger than a pencil, but when it shot through a zebra's chest, head, or back, they didn't get up to the fight again. Cloudy Knights fought like stardust. Her hoof-to-hoof -hoof combat style was quick and light, but each blow was perfectly placed to take her enemy down. On top of that, she was a great marks pony. She could only, only carry a pistol in her muzzle when she fought, but that too was just as accurate as her blows. Then I caught sight of Night Stalker himself. He moved like a demon. His uh, attacks were so fast that they were a blur. His shimmering swords cut down Zebra before he even knew what hit him. His plasma rifles on his battle saddle melted Zebras right and left. When he could kill a zebra with his rifles or his wing swords, he would simply twist around and applebuck them as hard as he could. With his size and strength of his armor gave him, his kicks were so powerful the zebras were dead before they hit the ground. Finally, when the battle seemed like it had been going to go bad for the city of Pegasus, the Royal Guard finally caught up. As soon as they entered the city, the zebras started to go down in waves. 
Dozens of ponies in power armor blew through the lines of zebra, making room for the rest of the small group army of ponies. Blood filled the streets now, and piles of corpses littered the streets as the zebra's morale started to break. It was then that the voice of Comet Tail spoke into the radio built into Greta's helmet. I found Petal. She's on the north side. She was trying to flee with some of the other civilians. I'm on my way. Do whatever you can to keep her and the ponies she's with safe, Greta said as she opened her wings and took off. My host turned and flew toward where Comet Tail was at. Then something caught her eye. She looked down as she flew, and she saw a single zebra running down an alleyway, leading right for where Comet Tail and Petal were. Something was glowing on his back as he flew towards the small group of ponies. My host could just make out yelling, For Rome! Greta picked up speed as she yelled into a radio. Comet Tail, you have an incoming zebra coming for your six. He's got a bomb! Greta lost sight of him for a moment as she dodged around one of the taller buildings. As she flew around it, Comet Tail responded, don't worry, I see. She was cut off by a huge explosion, filling the air with a blast of fire erupting from the distance. Greta screamed, Comet Tail! She just finished getting around the building when she saw what happened. Three smaller buildings that had been right where the ponies were had been turned to rubble. A small crater was in the middle of the destruction and bodies littered the area around it. Greta landed hard next to the alley where she'd seen the zebra. She took a moment to look over the damage before her eyes locked on a hunk of blackened meat from the suicidal zebra. His body had been thrown back against the far wall near her, most of his body destroyed in the blast. A few feet away, Comet Tail was lying dead, her face mostly destroyed, a leg missing, and her combat armor mostly torn away in the blast. No. No, no, no. No! Greta said as she ran over to her comrade. You damn fool! You should have gotten out of here! A weak voice echoed across the destruction. G Greta? My host's head snapped up as she looked over to see a green Pegasus mare lying a few feet outside the blast zone. She jumped back to her talons and ran over to her. Petal, the less do you know. Prickly Petal was lying on the ground, smiling weakly up at the griffin. Three chunks of meat metal scraps were lodged in her belly, one in her right foreleg. You... Yeah. Looked really great in that armor, Greta. My host gingerly pulled the Pegasus closer. Don't talk. We need to get you to a doctor. Petal coughed, blood cascading from her muzzle for a moment before she was able to speak again. No, there's no time. Listen to me, Greta. I need to tell you something before I can't anymore. I could feel tears welling up in my host's eyes. Don't talk like that. We can still... It's too late. I'm a smart mare. I know how bad it is. Before I'm gone, I need you to do me a favor. Greta sat down and opened up her power armor. Stepping out, she went back to Petal and pulled her into her lap. What do you need? She smiled and her eyes got a faraway look as she spoke. I need you to swear to me that you'll keep watching over Mooney. Greta sniffed. That's a silly favor to ask. No, he's my best friend. I know. But after I'm gone, I'm scared he's going to let his anger grow. I think he thinks he can't be happy. Not after he lost his parents. Not after he was forced to come back to Equestria. We're the only family he has. He needs us. Please don't let my death push him over the edge. He's already get, done so much as it is. Ever since he lost Big Mac... He'll be okay. I'll make sure of it. Petal started to cough again. When she finished, her voice sounded weaker. I know. He's planning with his project. He's having stable tech build him. I looked over the files in his office while I went to inspect the cavern below the base. If he's able to finish it, and if it goes wrong, whatever he creates may be worse than this war. We have to talk him out of this foolish notion of making a new... She started to cough again. Her body started to go cold in Greta's talons. But if it works, Greta said once Petal stopped again. If it works, I'm not sure if it'll be good or bad. That's why I came to a new Pegasus early. I wanted to ask him to stop. I wanted to ask him to stop being the captain. She started to cry. 
I don't want him to hurt anymore. I just want him to be happy. And just come home and be moony again. And I'll do whatever I can. Petal smiled again, and her body relaxed as the griffin's grip. Please do. Hey, Greta. Can I ask you something else? Her eyes closed. Anything? Do you... I love him. I felt my host's body stiffen. I love him like a brother, if that's what you mean. She shook her head. It's not that I shouldn't have asked it. It's not like it matters. He's a pony, I'm a griffin, and he's marrying lightning. I know. But the Greta I know wouldn't let things like that bother her. Oh, well. Maybe it's too hard to think about the war and all the shame. She smiled again, as her eyes opened and the most of the light had vanished from them. I know that I loved him. He never saw it, though. He just saw me as his little sister. But I've been in love with him since the day he came to live with us. He was so handsome and sad. I just wanted to. She lost the thought, and I could see a little bit of panic in the young Pegasus's face. Greta pulled her in close. Pedal! I... No, and don't you worry. I'll make sure he's okay. I'll watch after him for you. I'll tell him how you felt, but... Please. You have to hold on. Mooney? I'm sorry. She said. He's not here, Pedal. He's still fighting. Greta said. She didn't seem to hear. I'm sorry I didn't tell you I was coming here today, Mooney. I just wanted to c come home. Big brother, please come. Petal's body shook violently for a moment, and a small whisper of air left her muzzle as her body went limp. Greta started to sob uncontrollably. Then she threw her head in the air and let out a scream that would make Wind Thrasher jealous. A long, high-pitched noise that carried across the battle. A moment later, three Shadow Bolts landed next to her, and one Pegasus in black and blue power armor. Night Stalker slowly walked over to my host. Then, removing his helmet, he fell to the dirt next to his dead little sister, and Greta, who was still holding her close. Petal. No. Please, no. Greta choked back a sob when she said, She tried to get away. The Cometail found her and the others here. I was protecting them. And a suicide bomber took them out before I could reach him. Night Stalker pulled the dead mare into his arms. I can't. I can't lose her, too. Most of the children of the night showed up as Night Stalker held onto his sister. Thunder laid and moved closer. Sir, we drove them out. Only a few got away. We were able to capture at least fifteen of them. What do you want us to do? Should we send them over to Pinky? Night Stalker slowly set his sister down, used a hoof to close her eyes. Then he stood and looked over at his team, then the shadow bolts behind them and what was left of Lost Pegasus. No. Then, what should we do? Luna still wants to know if they're planning anything else. Lightning said, walking closer to her captain. He looked over at all of them for a long moment. Then his gaze fell on my host. You said they were killed by a suicide bomber, right? My host nodded. Yes, sir. His gaze fell on the soldiers and his team again. Kill them all. Leave only five alive to get over to Pinky. But only after Manette goes through their memories. One of the Shadow Bolts walked over. Are you crazy, Night Stalker? The Zebras we captured are prisoners of war. We can't just kill them. Night Stalker's tail whipped around and stopped an inch away from the mare's neck. The glowing stinger sparkled a little. I'm not going to repeat myself, Commander Blaze. The mare started to shake, then she took a single step back. Yes, sir? He pulled his tail back and yelled. Search the surrounding areas for any zebras. If they have stripes, they die. Now move out! Every last pony apart from his team took off. Manette started to say, Sir, you need to calm down. 
Night Stalker interrupted her. Minette, don't try and give me orders. Now, I want you to get new air and bring him to Stargazer Labs. Every one of his team's eyes got wide, as Minette said. We scrapped that project months ago, sir. Why bring him there? Night Stalker looked back at his dead sister. Then his eyes moved up to look at the dead comet tail. I want him to look into what we did, so he can tell us what we did wrong. Show him everything and see if he can help us make falling shadows better. We can't let something like this happen again. We lost another one of our teammates today, and I lost my sister. We're going to put a stop to this, once and for all. Now go. No one moved. Greta put a talon on his shoulder. Captain. He looked over at his friend, and the anger I saw in Night Stalker's emerald green eyes scared me more than anything I'd seen before. Let me go. Mooney, I just... I told you not to call me that! He yelled. That buck is dead and gone. I am Night Stalker now. Now, do as I ordered, or else... Greta's talons slowly slid off his shoulder. He looked down at the ground and said in a quiet voice, Understood, sir. The others did as well, and they all went off to do what he said. When they were all gone, Night Stalker looked back at Greta, and his hard demeanor fell, and he started to sob. I'm sorry, my friend. I'm just... so angry now. His sudden change of personality was so sudden, I wasn't sure what had just happened. But Greta seemed to understand. She pulled Night Stalker close to her and let him cry. She didn't say anything for a long moment. She just held her friend and let him be a normal pony for a few moments. She let him be the big brother who had just lost his sister, before he had to go back to being that hard pony again. When he started finally to stop shaking, my host's eyes went wide as she said, Boss, I don't see Bab seed in the others. Night Stalker pulled away from her with a look of worry on his face. Shit, you're right. He pulled back his helmet and turned on his radio as my host got back into her power armor. Team, locate Babs. She might be hurt. As the rest of the team started to respond to their captain's orders, a soft voice echoed around Night Stalker and Greta's. The voice was the same one I heard in the memory of Night Stalker's team taking down the Pegasus who destroyed and betrayed the Equestriate of Rome. And then there were eight. As I came out of the memory orb, I couldn't help but thinking that I missed something. Just like Mom said in her note about the last orb, she told me to watch it carefully. But it was hard to. Too much happened during that memory, from Night Stalker's new armor, to the assault on Crimson Canyon, the fight in Las Pegasus, to the death of another one of the Children of the Night, and the death of Night Stalker's sister. At the end, it seemed like something also happened to Babseed as well, but what? She couldn't have died because, from what Mom said in the memory of when I was cured, she said Babs was killed by Greta. Then I remembered that voice. It said something about, and then there were eight? When Night Stalker killed Captain Flash Sentry, the same thing happened, only it said there were nine. Back then, I saw the memory of when Night Stalker brought Lightning Dust in to join the children. She was the last member to join. On that day, there were Night Stalker, Manette, Amethyst Star, Thunderlane, Cloudy Knights, Comet Tail, Babseed, Phoenix Heart, Greta, who wasn't there but was still a member, and Lightning joined them to make ten members for the Children of the Night. Phoenix Heart was killed by Zappin on the same night that the captain killed Flash Sentry. Then he died. He said he cursed Night Stalker and his team. If that curse was a thing killing off the Children of the Night, then why did that voice say eight when there were still nine since Zappin had joined them? Was it because he wasn't a full member, or was it because Night Stalker didn't trust him? What am I missing? Then it hit me. Zappin had changed his name to Nuer after he made a blood oath to help Night Stalker end the war. He wasn't cursed like the rest of them because he joined afterwards. Night Stalker also told Manette to take Nuer into the Stargazer Labs to learn more about what he could from Falling Shadows, the new project they were working on. Towards the beginning of the memory, Greta talked to Nuer about what he learned from the old books. Nowhere said something about a tribe of zebras called the Star Cattery. Lightning, uh, Night Stalker, 
wanted to use the power of the stars as some kind of weapon to the end of the war. He was using Nowhere as his knowledge to help him finish his plans. Mom was researching the project called Falling Shadows. I remember that from her notes. At first, she was looking into how it could be used to save my life. But later, she ended up looking more into Stargazer. I thought she didn't find the right project at first, but I was wrong. She had found the right project. She just worked backwards to get to Stargazer, because she knew the power it had could save me. She needed powerful light magic to destroy the darkness around my heart. It always wondered why she kept working on this quest of hers even after I was safe. It's because she knows something more about Falling Shadows, the project that succeeded Stargazer. Something else hit me just then, too. The words Aquila said to me when I was a filly. She says she wants to use it to cure you, and I'm sure she does. But I can see what's in a pony's heart, and she wants my power for more than just saving you. Mom wants to find Falling Shadows so she can take whatever power it has for herself, and she's using me to fulfill her goal. She knew she missed something in that orb, because she didn't see as many, or at least the same memory orbs I had about the Children of the Night. Somehow, she knew I'd learn what she didn't, and I'd be able to put the pieces together. The question was, why does she need the Mark II? Why does she need this Mark II? Stable 9 was where they placed to keep them away from Nightstalker. Sweetabelle had asked Applebloom to hide them there. Sweetabelle must have found something out about Falling Shadows, and used her pip buck to lock him out of it, or at least something he needed to make it work. Then she begged her friend to hide all three. That's why the memory orbs of Night Stalker were in the stable as well. That way, the stable dwellers from Stable 9 would know who he was and his team. They were sure that no matter what, Night Stalker wouldn't get his hooves on the Mark II. If Dr. Cell hadn't attacked the Overmare in the stable, the Mark II would be safely hidden away. Mom knew from the beginning that she needed it. That's why she tricked Cookie Bite's mom into taking it off. She learned about the Mark II before she even left home. She knew more about the Children of Nightmare more than any pony alive. That's why she left it with me and came right to New Pegasus. She needed to get her hooves on the pip buck. The question is, how did she know it was in Trotston? Fuck, that's right. Elder Wolfsbane had gone to Stable Tech headquarters a long time ago. He must have found out what was in Stable 9 while he was there. Mom was working with him while she was in the Hidden Sands. He told her about the Mark II and the stable it was in. She must have figured one of them was made, made it out of the stable when the ponies escaped. I was starting to wonder and understand what Mom was doing. I didn't know why she wanted this power or who she's working for, but it had to do something with Wolfsbane. How long had she been hiding her true intentions? Who else knew what she was doing or why? The only answer I could think of was Vervain. She's the only pony I knew who may know what Mom was trying to do. She said something to Mom about her mission when she left the stable eight years ago. Vervain also used to work with Elf Wolfsbane and Los Alicorn before she came back to Hidden Sands. She may be part of this too, and I trusted her. She's the one who pushed me to leave the stable. She's the one who made sure I went looking for Mom. She's the one who told me to get the Pip Buck to Mom. Well, I can't do it. Not until I talk to Vervain about all this. I'm getting the truth one way or another. I'm not any pony's puppet. Not my mom's, or Wolfbane's, or Vervain's. I'm my own mare. This is my life, and I won't let them use me again, no matter how much I owed my life to them. I'm getting the truth, and once I do that, and I find out what this falling shadows is, I'm going to destroy it. If so many ponies wanted it, and Night Stalker put so much work into building it, then I can't let it fall into the wrong pony's hooves. I finally opened my eyes, wondering how long I was out. It was then that I realized I was laying against Aura's belly as she slept. We were both outside the sky carriage, lying next to a mostly burnt-out campfire. Slowly, I sat up and saw every pony else was asleep. I wasn't sure where we were. From the temperature and the landscape, I figured we had to be close to New Pegasus. I looked around the small camp and saw a bright blue-white light in a, with a small break in the cloud layer. It illuminated the top of the sky carriage, and sitting on top of it was the dark outline of a pony. He was looking up at the cloudy night sky, a tuft of dark mane flowing in the soft breeze. Then he spoke as if he were talking to no pony but himself. His voice was one I knew too well. It was a stranger. Celestia or Luna. If you were up there, I could really use your help. 
I'm lost. I don't know where I should go next. I want to tell her, but I don't know how. I'm not even sure she'd believe me if I did. Every pony's been lying to her for so long, so why would she believe me? Am I doing the right thing by keeping my promise to look over her and guide her to her true purpose? Is she ready to take on the role of being the new guardian? I've been doing this for so long, and I'm starting to lose face in everything because of it. I don't want to put her through this. But what other choice do I have? What was he talking about? Was he talking about me or some other pony? I moved slowly to get back to my hooves. But as I did, my hoof slipped on a rock. The stranger's head flipped around, and all I could see of him was his bright green eyes looking down at me. The embers of the dying fire shimmered off the dark face, not covered by bandages. The light was poor, and I could still couldn't make out his face, only his eyes. A moment later, his hoof came up and pulled the white bandages over his face. His head once again covered from the world. He picked up his black hat and covered the last bit of his mane that poked out of the top of his bandages. I moved closer to look at him. Those aren't really bandages. It's a mask. He looked down at me for a long moment, before nodding and saying in a quiet voice, They are what they are. It makes it easier to discard if I need to. Come up here and sit with me, Shadow. I'd like to have a word with you before you get back to New Pegasus. I sighed, used my magic to teleport myself up to him. I moved to sit next to him and watched as he went back to looking up at the clouds. I hope I didn't interrupt anything? I saw him smile a little. Not really. I just got lost in old memories is all. Memories of who? He sighed and let his gaze move down from the clouds to me. Lost loved ones and friends. Who are you? I asked. I've told you already. I'm no pony. I have no name, no face, no family and friends. Only duty. I'm the guardian. Nothing more, nothing less. Bullshit. You're some pony I know. Or at least one that I knew when I was younger. Is that why you're hiding your identity from me? I've told you before, Shadow. I can't tell you who I am or let you see my face, in case some pony takes that knowledge from you. Or you don't want me to know who you are because you're scared of how I'll react. I know it's bullshit. All of it. There's more to you than just a stallion who's looking after me for nightshade. Who are you? were you talking about just a moment ago? No, pony. Stop lying to me and tell me who you are. Please. I'm tired of being left in the dark. I want someone to tell me the truth for once. Are you Stryker? His eyes went wide when I said his name. No. I'm not him. Then you know who he is. I said. Every pony from Nimbus knows who Stryker is. He's your uncle. The stallion who killed his parents and fled the Enclave. He became a rebel who did everything he could to bring down the Enclave. For years, he killed scores of Pegasi, even killing some of the former council ponies in Thunderhead, Navarro, Stratus, and Nimbus. In the end, it was his undoing. He tried to go up against Navarro itself and died because of it, the stranger said. I figured he would have said something about Stryker being dead, but the way he said it made me believe he was telling the truth. That was too much detail for a quick lie. Then why'd you act the goddesses if you should tell her who you are? I know you meant me. He chuckled lightly. And how do you know that? Who else could it be? You're here now, waiting for me to wake up from a memory orb. Who else could be talking about? Are you my dad? He sighed again, his hoof coming to rest on my shoulder. I wish I could tell you I was, but... Don't tell me he's dead. I remember my mom using a spell to make me on me to make me think he was dead. She did the same with Vervain. The stories I've heard from every pony say the same thing. He died attacking the Steel Rangers. His unit was wiped out. But I don't think it was. You have to be him. Why else would you be helping me like you are? You're too smart for your own good, you know that. I'm my mother's daughter. Smarts. Running the family. He sighed again, and his hoof slowly fell to my shoulder. To answer your question... I'm not him. But as for your father's death... 
No pony knows what really happened to him. He did attack the Steel Rangers, and his unit was wiped out. But we never found his body. No pony was left alive to tell us what happened to him. For all we know, he could either be a prisoner of the Steel Rangers, or he was dragged away and later killed by them. He could have lived through the attack and died later by some kind of creature. Nightshade led the search for him. They tried to find him for months, but nothing was ever turned up. If he is alive, I can't help you. Even if he is out there somewhere, he wouldn't be the same pony you knew back then. In the last few weeks before he attacked the rangers, he was losing his mind, I think. Nightshade tried to stop him from going after you, but in the end, he failed. I just want to understand why Nightshade or you care enough about me to put yourselves at risk. I don't get it. I'm not that important. I'm just a mare, I said. Shadow. You're more than just a mare. Yeah, I know. My Pip-Buck, I started to say, but he cut me off. No, it's not because of that. Nightshade would have sent me to keep an eye on you, even if you were the most uninteresting mare in the Wasteland. He may not show it, but he does care about what happens to you. He thinks of you as family, maybe because of his friendship with your father. I'm not sure. He wants you to be safe and happy. And that's why he made sure to clear your name so the Enclave would leave you alone. If that's true, then why is he sending me after Mom? He shrugged. I may owe my life to Nightshade, but that doesn't mean I know everything about what he's thinking. Uh, it could be that he wants to help you find her. Or because he knows you need to finish what you started. I think he wants me to kill her. The stranger was silent for a moment. I don't think he wants her dead, though after what she has done, it may be unavoidable. The best thing would be for you to fix her memories. That would be the best way to bring her back. If I knew how to do that, I would have done it already. He chuckled again, then reached under his trench coat and pulled out a leather-bound book. And this is one reason I wanted to meet with you before you went back to New Pegasus. This is one of your mother's spell books. Night say Shade said she found it in an old library. It's full of useful spells, but most of all, it's where your mother learned most of her memory spells. If you study it, you may find a counterspell that can fix what happened to Grimm. I took the spell book and my magic and opened it slowly. The pages were old and worn, but very preserved for how old it had to be. How did you get your hooves on this? When Grimm left the Crystal Empire with you, she did leave a few things behind. When your father died, Nightshade made sure to get a hold of his possessions. This was one of them. When I told you uh, he needed to learn memory spells, he said that you could learn this. I closed the book and set it down. It's not a bad idea, but there's a problem. How so? To perform a counterspell or a spell reversal, I'd have to know what spell she used to remove her memories. I may not know any memory spells, but I know a lot about them from Mom. There isn't just one kind of memory spell. She used over 50, maybe more. There is ways to block a memory, pull one from a pony's head, ways to view a memory, and so many more. Any of those spells could have been used to make her forget me. I wouldn't even know where to start. Hmm. Well, I may be able to help with that, the stranger said. From the reports Nightshade read, Grimm was trying to use a special and hard memory spell on another unicorn. And that unicorn used some kind of spell to make your mother's magic rebound on her. From the pony who made the report, they said that the spell was meant to remove the memory of a pony who was special to that some pony. Since it rebounded back to your mother, it took away her memories of you. That doesn't make any sense. If that spell was used, Mom wouldn't know anything about me. She'd only forget the past few years. She thinks that I died, but she still knows she had a daughter. I wouldn't know. All I know is that was written in the report. Maybe she had her own kind of ward against that kind of magic. You may be onto something here. When I told Vervain Mom forgot who I was, she said that shouldn't be possible. She told me that Mom placed protection spells on herself to keep her ponies from reading her memories or removing them. She said that only Mom could use memory spells on herself. If that spell rebounded, maybe those protection spells stopped the magic from wiping everything away. It's possible. 
But the question is, does that help you? He asked. Maybe. I'll have to look through the book and see what I can learn from it. If I can find the spell that matches the one she used, then I might be able to reverse it. And that is, if I can get close enough to her to use a spell like that, and if I'm strong enough. Memory spells take a lot of power to cast, and if you do it wrong, you end up hurting yourself. And then I suggest that you look into it. I will. If it can save Mom, I'll do that. Though I'm not sure I can trust her. She looked at me quizzically. Why is that? I sighed. I think she's been using me to help her own mission. That's why she left the Mark II for me, and why she wanted me to search for her and find the memory orbs. Something bigger's going on, and I feel like I'm stuck in the middle of it with no idea what I'm really doing. The stranger reached out and patted my back a little. Maybe she is. But it may not be as bad as you think. Don't give up hope so quickly. Just don't play her game. Do what you think is right. That's all that matters. I smiled. Thank you, stranger. It's no problem, Shadow. We both sat there for a long time, just watching the clouds as the small light from the moon shone through. After some time passed, I asked, Stranger, do you have any children? He didn't answer for a long time. Finally, he looked over. I saw tears in his eyes. He saw that I noticed and quickly wiped them away before saying, I did. I had a wife, too. What happened to them? I lost them, because I was too weak to save them. I was always too busy to be with them. I was always flying between Nimbus and Stratus. I always told myself that my work as the Guardian was too important to worry about others. I was a selfish stallion back then. My wife knew it, too. But she loved me and supported me. She was a good mare. So beautiful. And kind. They were my fool. I wish I would have spent life's time doing this and spend it with them. And the sad part is, even after losing them both, nothing's changed for me. It's like my life continues as normal. Like I had no wife or a foal. He said, his voice going quiet. The wasteland's everywhere. No matter what you do to keep it away, it always finds you. Even in the Cloud Cities, I guess. He sighed. That it does. As he spoke, he pulled out a little hoof-made doll shaped like a bird. When I saw it, I asked, Was that your foal's doll? He pulled it close to his face and took a deep breath as more tears fell from his eyes. After a moment, he turned it and put it in a pocket inside of his coat. Yes. It was. It's all I have left to remember them by. Even after so many years, it still smells like them. Or at least I tell myself it does. For the first time, I felt bad for the mysterious pony who kept his face hidden from the world. The pony who went out of his way to protect others and who lost his family keeping a secret project hidden from the world. He'd given up so much for his duty. Now I saw him for who he really was. A sad, lonely stallion who hated himself for not being there when his family needed him. Was that how my father felt when Mom left with me? I'm sure it was, even though I couldn't remember his face. I did remember a lot of times when my dad read me stories. He told me about his day at work. Held me on the days where my sickness got bad and I couldn't even move. We had been close. When Mom took me away from him, it must have been like some pony ripped part of his soul away. I'm sorry if I brought up bad memories. I said finally. He sniffed and dried his eyes again. It's not your fault. And I wouldn't have said they were bad memories. I just... miss them. That's all. I know. I feel the same about my dad. I just wish I could remember his face. His name. Anything apart from his voice, and not even that's clear. The stranger smiled again and looked over at me. He was a good stallion. He could be a little hard-headed at times, but... He was still good. How old did you know him? I asked. Not as well as Nightshade, but well enough to miss his company. Can... Can you at least tell me his name? Maybe then I'll be able to find out more about him? He opened his muzzle, saying, 
And I guess you'll find out sooner or later. His name is... Right as he was about to say something, my father's name, he started to choke, and a small glow of blue light escaped his muzzle instead of words. He frowned and coughed, clearing his throat. What the hell? I was about to say the same thing. What was that? I have no idea. Let me try that again. His name is... It happened again. This time, the stranger fell and coughed harder. Why can't I say his name? I've spoken of him to others before. I felt something creeping on my back, and a moment later I heard Orikala's whisper in my ear. That's a silent spell. It has some kind of magic my sister was good at. She must have run into the stranger before and made sure he can't speak your father's name to you. But why would she do that? I whispered back. The stranger looked at me. Why would who do what? My uncle said quickly, I'm not sure, but I have seen that spell before. She used it on me. For some reason, she wants to make sure you can't find your dad. I didn't want the stranger to know about Orikala, so I replied, I was just thinking I've seen that spell before. Did you run into my mom at some point in the past? Before she lost her mind? Only once, and she tried to attack me. She did land a blow, but the spell didn't seem to do anything. At least I thought it didn't. Are you saying she made it so I couldn't speak his name to you? It's possible. She didn't want me to think he was dead. Maybe she wanted to make sure I couldn't go looking for him, or find out more about him. I'm not sure why. Can you remove it? I don't think so. Not unless this spell's in the book. I don't see what I can do. Fuck. I knew what I got too lightly in that lot fight. He said, stomping a hoof. Wait, why was Mom trying to kill you if she hadn't lost her memories yet? He winced a little. <clears throat> well, Nightshade did send me to capture her when we found her location. This was a week or so before she lost her memories. He knew what it meant when I showed up, and she tried to kill me. I think the best thing to do is to find her and find out why she wanted to keep my father's name a secret. I agree, he said, then jumped to his hooves. Shit. I've just realized I spent too much time here. Huh? What do you mean? I only came down here to give you that spell book, and to give you something else. Nightshade's on his way back to Stratus right now. If I'm gone too long, the ponies around him will wonder where I'm at. He said, reaching inside, and pulling out a huge case. I wanted to make sure he just got back to Stardust. He left it behind when he went after you when he was pride. I took the case with my magic and opened it up. Inside was Wrath's AMR. The scope was mostly destroyed, and I could see some of Wrath's blood still on it. Why give him this? It's a good rifle to have. Why would he leave this behind when he came after me? With this, he could have easily killed us. I asked. Two reasons. One, he hadn't had time to fix the scope yet. Second, he can't fire it. The rifle has huge kick. Since he's not a unicorn, he'll have to fire it like any other old rifle. With his recoil, if he fired, he'll lose most of his teeth. When he was pride, he was going to install a gem that would take away most of the recoil so he could fire it. But he didn't have the time. I figured that since he took it from Wrath, it should... He should be the one to have it. I closed the case. I guess so. But I'm not sure how well he'll feel about it now that he's back in his right mind. If he doesn't want it, then that's up to him. If he wants to sell it, he'll still be able to get a good price for it, even in the condition it's in. I'll make sure he gets it, I said. Thank you. Well, I'm heading back now. I'll check in with you in a few days. In the meantime, stay safe. He said, opening his wings. Oh, and Shadow. Yeah? He smiled. You and Aura look cute together. Don't mess it up. I blushed as he chuckled. He tapped a gem on his coat, and in a flash, he was gone. Fuck! I just remembered I was going to ask him about the strange unicorn hex and tell him he was trying to get his hooves on the stranger's revolver for some kind of goddess-awful reason. I guess I'll just have to tell him next time I see him. It's not like hex is going to just show up a new pegasus and attack him. Now that I thought about it, he said he was a hunter. 
just like Squirrel and Moose. Maybe I should visit him at the JetBlue Skyport, see if they knew anything about him. Hey, Shadow. Why are you all the way up there? I heard Aura ask. Turing, I saw she was rubbing her eyes, looking up at me. Sorry, I was just talking to the stranger. You just missed him. She yawned. Damn, I wanted to ask him something. I jumped down and walked over to her. Like what? Nothing important. Ah, oh, come on, tell me, I said. She yawned again. Tomorrow, right now, I just want to get back to sleep. You should do the same. We have a long day tomorrow, and you need your rest. I spent the past few hours in a memory orb. I don't think I need rest. Honestly, I felt tired, but sleep just didn't seem... It seemed silly after being in the orb for so long. Yeah, it's not the same thing. You need real sleep, she said, reaching out and taking hold of my forehoof. Doctor's orders. Now get over here. I giggled as she pulled me close, and soon I found myself wrapped in her forelegs, my head resting on her chest as her wings covered me like a blanket. I didn't think I needed sleep, like she said, but as soon as my eyes closed, I drifted off to sleep. The sounds of Aura humming a little tune to herself was the last thing that I heard. The next day, I was woken by a wingnut. Who wouldn't stop poking me? Don't you ever get up before noon? I yawned and opened my eyes slowly. Not unless I have to. What time is it? Six in the morning. Now get up. We have to head out. He said, poking me again. I'm up. Fuck, kid. Give him air a moment. I said, getting up. Aura must have gotten up before me, letting me sleep a little longer. She was sitting by the dead fire, eating something that looked like meat from a can. I looked over to her and asked, What the fuck is that? Cram. Want some? She asked, her beak full of... Yuck. No thanks. Ponies don't eat meat. I said, reaching into my saddlebags and pulling out some sugar apple bombs. Stardust chuckled. That's not true. Ponies can eat meat. We just don't do it much. Yaksha stuck her tongue out. That is just gross. Why would a pony apart from a raider eat meat? She thought for a moment. Then again, there was that one time that I cooked ant meat. She shook her head. No, ant meat and actual meat are two different things. Wingnut looked at her with disgust on his face. You ate meat from a bug? She nodded. It is just an insect. They are not bad, if I am being honest. The colt stuck his tongue out at her. No thanks. I'll pass on that. Stardust laughed again. I take it you haven't had bacon. The zebra looked at him confused. What is bacon? It's... Wait, you don't know what bacon is? No, but if it is meat, then I do not care to know what it is. She said as she looked over at me. Shadow, is that all that you are going to eat? I nodded. It's all I have and it's really good. She sighed. That is all sugar. You cannot live off of just that. Here, try something that I cooked up last night. Wait, you have more of that strange stuff you made last night? Wingnut said excitedly. I want more! I looked at what she pulled out of her bags. It was some kind of green and yellow plants covered in a white paste. I think I'll pass. That looks nasty. Wingnut's jaw dropped open. It's the best thing I've ever eaten, Shadow. You really have to try it. The kid's not wrong, Shadow. I don't think I've had anything like it before. Windthrasher ate four helpings of it. Stardust said. When Thrasher blushed, it made me feel better and it was good. Yaksha blushed, smiled happily. I made dinner for everyone last night. Sadly, you were still in that memory orb when we all went to bed, or I would have made sure you had some as well. Also, yes, Wingnut, I have more than plenty for everyone. Even Nora. No, thanks. I don't eat that kind of thing. I don't care how good it looks, but a griffin can't live off plants alone. We need meat every now and then. And I haven't had any in weeks. I need to get my strength up. I'm still recovering. 
Aura said before slurping a big chunk of something out of the can. I gagged a little, then looked back at Yaksha. Well, if they all think it's good, I guess I'll try it. It can't be anywhere near as gross as that anti-venom Aura made. Bite me, shrimp. That gross stuff saves your life. She said with a smile. Ignoring her, I took a helping from Yaksha. Slowly, I took a small bite, expecting to start gagging as soon as I tried to swallow. But as soon as it touched my tongue, my eyes went wide and I took a bigger bite. Oh my goddesses. This has to be the most wonderful food I've seen in my whole life. Yaksha laughed. It is a simple recipe. I could teach you how to make it if you wish. Hell yeah! If I can add food like this every day, I'd be the happiest mayor on Equus. And then I will make sure to add that to the lessons we will start later today. Yaksha said, starting to eat her own meal. This kind of meal is also very good for you. How so? I asked as I ate the last of what she gave me. Zebra recipes can help you in many different ways. That brew is an old zebra meal for increased stamina and agility. You'll have more energy for the whole day and feel less hungry later. Now that's useful to know. What else can you make? I asked. Yaksha took a moment to think. Well, I am not as skilled with potions as my mother was, but I do know how to make a potion that can heal you faster and better than a normal healing potion made by magic. I know potions that can strengthen your bones, some that will enhance your sight, and a few more. I also know a lot of regular food recipes as well. Do they all taste this good? Wingnut asked, with his muzzle still full of food. Hey, kiddo. Swallow before you speak, please. Stardust said. Wingnut gulped, then smiled. Sorry, Stardust. Stardust's face hoofed. Please tell me I wasn't that annoying as a cult. We all laughed, then Yaksha said. Most of them are good, though some of them are a bit of an acquired taste. It sounds like some of what you could use to help us if we're in a fight. I said. And I can. Though I would suggest that you try not to alter yourself too much with my brews. Some of the brews I know only last a day or two, but most will stay with you forever. If you use too many of those, it could have a negative effect, not a positive one. One should never alter themselves too much. But if we wanted something to change us one thing about ourselves, that'd be okay? I asked. It would. But I would still think before you decide to do so, Yaksha said. Hm, I guess you have a point, I replied. That I do. Now, we must be going, yes? Yaksha said as she got to her hooves. Yeah, I'd like to reach cartwheel today, Aura said, getting up and stretching. Oh, I'm still not up to full strength. You can take a break, Aura, Windthrasher said. I'm feeling a lot better after eating Yaksha's cooking last night and today. Are you sure? She asked. Yeah, but if I start to get tired, I'll be sure to let you know. Windthrasher said with a big smile, showing off her rows of sharp teeth. One day I'm going to have to tell her how creepy that looks, but for now I'll let it go. All right then, let's head out, Aura said. Oh, before I go, I said, running over to the sty carriage and pulling out the case the stranger gave me last night off the roof where I left it. The stranger was here last night. He wanted me to give this to you, Stardust. He looked at the case and opened it. And this is Wrath's AMR? Why is he giving it to me? He said you should have it since you took it from Wrath. He looked a little sick at the memory of the night that must have flashed in his head. I did. But it still feels wrong to take this. I think you should have it. I know you killed him because you weren't in your right mind, but maybe by using this his best rifle, it'd be a way to honor his memory. I mean, after what you told me about the night and Wraith's past, I kind of feel bad for killing him. I remember why I took it and what I was planning on doing with it, he said, slowly closing the case. Still, I'll hold on to it for now, when I think of what I can do with it. Maybe I'll fix it up some and make it easier for Pegasus to use. Good enough for me. Even if you decide to sell it later, it'll still be worth a lot of caps. I said happily. And it will, he said before picking up the case and walking into the sky carriage. Wind Thrasher hooked up to the front, and soon we were off. As soon as we started heading west again, Yaksha came over to where I was sitting in the carriage, looking over the book the stranger gave me last night. 
Aura was sitting to one side looking out the window. Shadow, are you ready to start learning what I have to teach you? She asked. I closed the book and looked up at her. I'm not sure. I still don't know how you can help me with my magical control or the other thing I have a problem with. It is true that I may not know how to use magic in the same way that you do, but I have read a lot of books and old scrolls about it. Since your own mother did not teach you how to use magic, at least that is what I am guessing from what your friends told me while you were in the orb, and then I can at least pass down the lessons that I learned in her place, Yaksha said, sitting next to me. I guess it can't hurt. What do you want me to do? She smiled. It is simple. From what I learned, you have a great amount of power, but not much control over what you have. At least, not as much as you should for what you can do. To fix this, you need to learn how to clear your mind. How can I do that? Do you know how hard it is for me to stop thinking? Aura chuckled. That's for sure. She can't even stop thinking when she has someone like me doing naughty things to her. Aura, I said, mortified. Wingnut's attention snapped the conversation from what we was having with Stardust to Aura. His jaw dropped open. Tell me everything. No, I said. Aura grinned. Well, I first noticed it when I was running my talons just under... Aura, I swear to Luna, don't say another word, I said, glancing over at her. Ah, but don't you think he deserves to know? Wingnut is the one who helped us get together, even though he has a huge crush on you. Yes, I do, he said, his eyes glued onto Aura. All of my friends laughed as I blushed out of embarrassment. I looked back at Yaksha. I give you my friends. Yaksha smiled. I remember being teased similarly with my group of friends that I traveled with. My eyes went wide. What do you mean, similarly? Yaksha frowned. Now is not the time, Shadow. We need to focus on this. She gestured at the book and went back to explaining to me that I needed to clear my mind. Also, while I am teaching her, I would like the rest of you to leave her alone. She does not have much time and I would like to make sure that she is not worrying about her love life. It turned out that what Yaksha said to do is meditate. She explained everything I needed to do, from how to sit, how to breathe. I listened to everything she said, doing my best to clear my mind. I didn't do very well at first. But as time went on, I started to understand what she was saying. This is how the first the next few hours went as we grew closer and closer to home. After she finished with her first lesson, she told me that I should take a break. For the rest of the trip, I pulled out Mom's spell book and looked up at the chapter that had to do with memory spells. An hour and a half later, I started reading the chapter about memory spells. Wind Thrasher said, Shadow! Closing the book, I walked over to the small window from the front of the sky carriage, asking, What's wrong, Wind Thrasher? She was staring, uh, starting to bring down the sky carriage. As she did, she said, I smell blood. A lot of blood. I looked at the map of my pip buck and saw that we weren't in front of Cartwheel. How far is it? Just a little bit down the road from Cartwheel? A little off the path, she said. I think I see Steel Ranger armor. Let's check it out. If something happened to one of the patrols, I'll have to make sure... Elder Apple Slice knows. Yeah, are you sure that's a good idea, Shadow? Or asked. No, but if Steel Rangers died near Cartwheel, the town might be in danger too. When Thresher landed the sky carriage and we all stepped out. As we did, Stardust asked. When Thresher, where are you smelling the blood? I don't see anything. She pointed towards a small hill a few feet away. Just down there. Uh, I don't want to get too close. The smell's making me feel... A little strange. Uh, let's go check it out. Yaksha, can you wait here with Windthrasher? I will, but if you need help, just yell, she said. The rest of us pulled out our weapons and slowly walked towards the hill. As we got closer, the metallic smell of blood filled my nostrils, and I gagged as the smell mixed with rotting flesh. As we rounded the bend, I saw six ponies in power armor lying dead in a black pool of dried blood. 
It looked like some pony with armor-piercing rounds. Uh, either ambushed them on their way to cartwheel or from it. It was strange that the smell of rotting flesh was so strong. Even with the power armor filled with holes, the armor should still keep away the smell more than this. And then I saw where it was coming from. A mare in gray robes was stuck to the small hill. Spikes driven through her hooves to keep her in place. Just like the memory orb I saw. Only, they didn't take her eyes or her tongue like the zebras did. It made it a lot easier to identify who the mare was. It was Elder Apple Slice. Some pony had attacked her even worse. It looked like it happened at least a week or more ago. The lower parts of her body were bloated from the blood collecting on her legs. Her tongue was sticking out as well, and it was black and dry. Her eyes were locked open. They too were dried out and gray. Whoever had done this had tortured them before finishing the job with a bullet to her head. At first, I would have thought zebras did this. Or maybe some strong raider group left over from Crackerjack's group. And then I saw what was carved onto her head in the rock. It said traitor. That word alone told me who had done this. If the Elder was being called a traitor, then she wasn't killed by other Steel Rangers. Holy shit, Nora said. This can't be good. Elder Appleslice was a good mare. Who would do this to her? Stardust said. It can only be the Steel Rangers. Either she was killed by her own ponies, or Wolfsbane. Whoever it is, they're gonna pay for killing her. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Zebra Brew. Well, what do you know? Zebra food is quite delicious. Due to your newfound love for the food you ate from Yaksha, you now gain a plus one boost to any of your special stats whenever you eat any zebra food, depending upon the effect it has. The effect only lasts for a few hours and only works once per day.